The Dali is quite interesting because basically we went to a, a Dali exhibit. I was quite obsessed with Dali. Um, probably because I developed a bit of a psychedelic lifestyle, to put it bluntly. So I got quite obsessed with Dali. And uh, I went to an exhibit. This is around about sort of 2000 and end of 2004. So I went to an exhibit with my dad, a uh, Dali exhibit. And we walked around, you know, and I hadn't had a smoke or anything. And just being around all this mass produced Dali stuff, like, yeah, it was mass produced, you know, you hear the, the myth, well, you hear the legend of uh, the fact that he just took all these blank sheets of paper, wrote his signature on them, and said, if people are just going to have cheap reproductions of my, of my work, then they deserve each other. <laughs> he was just such a fascinating character. I started just reading massively up on him, and it was like, wow, I love Dali. He's so good. I went to this exhibit, and it was like uh, they had these uh, statues about this high called space elephants. So it's like spindly legs, elephant thing, and then this big giant crystal uh, pyramid sort of obelisk thing on top made out of crystal. So the statue was gold, <laughs> well, bronze and gold. Uh, his signature was in gold. And uh, basically, yeah, you paid 200 quid instalments every month. I worked out if I work, if I paid that for about two years, I would own that statue. And I was so tempted, you know, just like, yes, that sounds too good to be true. I really want to own that. And then I just couldn't do it. It was like, no, I can't pay the rent. Can't get to that gig. Can't get those guitar strings. Can't do that. Can't do this. You know, can't fix the amp if the amp goes down. Right, I'm just going to have to really tighten my belt, won't be able to smoke. Oh no, <laughs> I don't know about this. Like, <laughs> It's a lot of an investment, you know, but I love his work. So I went home and I was really quite down about it. Uh, just picked up the guitar, been listening to uh, the Doors song, um, uh, Alabama song. Yeah, and I, I thought, I really like that. And also been listening to some gypsy music um, because I was in college with a guy that year who lent me um, some gypsy ballad CD that I ended up giving to John because I was just like, you appreciate this more than I will, you know. But maybe I'll appreciate it now, you know. But yeah, I gave it to John. Um, also gave him a mandolin around about that time. Just like, you know, mandolin, have that, <laughs> you know. Just like you do, I suppose. And uh, yeah, like, just wanted Dali to be like, uh, personified in this song. So wrote the verse first, you know, and then, like literally, John guessed how I wrote it. He said, "You just picked it up, you played a G minor, and you just went, Dali." <laughs> and it was just like, "Yeah." <laughs> That's pretty much how it happened. And then I went for the book and uh, just like saw all these lines and all these titles of paintings. So I put a load of paintings into the song, wrote that down on a piece of paper, um, and wrote this poem. The, the Dali song that I mentioned earlier that my dad actually really revered, which I thought was quite nice, that's quite touching, it was just, it meant a lot. Um, but yeah, just wrote this like poem, uh, basically plagiarising the lines out of his biography. Like, I like that page, that page is alright, highlighting all the different bits and then rewording it as poetry. And I've been like, yeah, that's, that's, that'll kind of do. <laughs> you know, almost like the cut up technique, but. There's just a real care and attention to detail in there, though. Yeah. For, yeah, for yeah. a song, some people just write a song and they wouldn't say they wouldn't go to that nth degree to try and yeah, get yeah, the yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I read about the letters that, like, the second verse um, is actually quotes from letters that his wife wrote, like where she says, uh, "Darley," she said um, to him in the letter to him that she wrote to him. Uh, she said, "Darley, they eat you alive, little one." And she was saying basically his hallucinations would take over his mind and uh, drive him mad. <laughs> so the second part of the song's kind of about that. <laughs> uh, the middle part though, the sevens, that was Ed Steel Fox's idea. He wanted it to be in sevens because obviously he likes paranoid androids <laughs> and uh, he just likes sevens. And uh, John Joe sat up all night with a little electronic drum kit teaching me how to play in sevens. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it was amazing. It's just like crammed into my room and he was up against the wardrobe and he was just playing this electronic kit teaching me how to play in sevens. 
and uh, yeah, like then we had the psychedelic hoedown because we wanted something for Johns to play with. <laughs> but I had it in mind the whole time. It was like I want this wicked solo. And that that night when we were playing with the kit, came up with a solo as well. So <laughs> it had two purposes, I suppose. Like. And you kept into four or five minutes. This could easily have gone on for a lot longer. So was the conscious decision to try and keep it fairly yeah, compact yeah, yeah. as well. Yeah, it was supposed to be. Like always trying to get away from the verse cause verse thing, mm. like because yeah you you did say yourself that uh, you thought the start of it's a chorus but it's a verse mm. and then it goes into a bridge and then the bridge section leads to the C section and then you get the uh, the sevens <laughs> you know which is the D section and then you're back to the verse for the solo essentially and then the solo leads back to another verse. And there's just like there's no real kind of chorus to it. I suppose it's completely <laughs> open to interpretation where the chorus is, but yeah, it's just like what that's what we did with the band. It was the whole point of the band was uh, to just not have verse, chorus, verse structures, and try to do something a little bit different, you know. And even the guitarist in the band, like yeah, he he influenced me with uh, new music that I wasn't really got into, you know. Like, and uh, yeah, <laughs> just, um, did you know that your audience that you had at that point would really like Dolly? Did you know you were on something special, or were you worried about it? Or uh, yeah, I played it down a pub um, at the Paul Pry, and John Joe was there that night. And I played it, and uh, Sam, the guitarist in Media Street, was there as well, and. Uh, I think Chris was there as well. I think Ed was there. I think the whole band was there, but kind of like in their own little groups, <laughs> you know, sort of hanging around with their own mates, I suppose. And uh, yeah, just ended up playing this open mic and did Dali, and everybody loved it. They were like, "Wow, you know, they just got it straight away." And it became like the song that I was thinking, "This is it. It's gonna make me. It's gonna make us massive," <laughs> you know. It was certainly your signature <laughs> tune for a long time, wasn't it? I got sick of playing it. <laughs> Uh, I, I want to step back on that as well. Uh, when you said you went to the Dali exhibition with your dad, was it his idea? Uh, he saw it, right. and he knew I'd always been into Dali. Right. Yeah. So it was his idea that you go down to the exhibition, and so I he, believe it was. Yeah, and he it? kind of took you down there. Yeah, I think he did. So he probably loved the song for the fact that he probably felt like he really reached you. <laughs> As a father, I would go, if I took my kids to see something and they crafted probably one of their greatest works from that, I would be immensely proud of that. I had a thought about it that way, but yeah. I suppose that's quite likely. I, I'm sure it reaches him very emotionally as well. I'm sure it does. So. Mm. 